So it's a great pleasure to have Mario Martone again uh, from UT Austin. He came uh, one time, he gave a nice Friday seminar, and we thought it was so fantastic that we wanted to get him back to <laughs> do the Monday seminar. So he didn't tell us about uh, Suka Fall Food Theories and these branches, from these branches and Vertex uh, on the ground. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so it's good to be here, and I, you know, it's, it's always a pleasure, and I'll be always happy to come. Uh, I mean, Austin is close enough. Um, so I think from uh, the last uh, seminar, so which I thought I don't remember exactly when it was, maybe March or something. Uh, I have quite a few more things to say, so that's actually hopefully interesting. And um, in the, I'm going to so basically, I mean, the talk that I'm going to give is uh, in the back of my mind. There is a kind of the overall uh, picture, a kind of program that I'm pushing. Uh, which is the note, the, the, the attempt to have a complete classification of four-dimensional and one to SCFDs. And, uh, and so today I'm going to specifically, so that's kind of the ultimate goal. Uh, I've done a lot of work with uh, Philip Argeris and collaborators on, um, on using the Coulomb branch, I'll review what the Coulomb branch is, and I'll be doing the talk. But in today I'm, I'm going to kind of uh, talk specifically on how uh, work by Leonardo Rastelli and Chris Beam, that some of my collaborators, uh, enters and further constrains the work that we already started with, uh, with Philip on, on, on Coulomb branches. And the central ideas are they, what is, is mixed branches, which I'll review in a second, and this important work that you know, the Leonardo and friends have done you know, about six or seven years ago, they show kind of a relationship, there's a connection between four dimensional and equal to SEFDs to, and, uh, and two dimensional conform fields. When I say SEFDs, I mean, uh, super control field theory, just, uh, just in case that I make uh, useless. Um, I don't want to get useless confusion. So the paper, again, the paper is probably, well, I don't know. I, I've, gotten, I've given a couple of talks and already had to change the, the, the numbers a couple, few times, so I don't know if it's actually going to show up in November, but hopefully by the end, uh, hopefully the first thing, the numbers are correct. But I mean, basically it's all written, but we're all very busy, we're all traveling, we're all doing different things. So, I'm trying to go to Oxford to see Chris and push it out, but we'll see. Pretty soon it be one, uh, uh, nine axis. Huh? Yeah. What's that? I was going to say, pretty soon it be one, XXX. Yeah, but probably, since it's, everything is going to change in general, I'll probably have to do XXX. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, good. So, uh, let me give you just a little bit of motivation. Uh, and then, I'll, I'll, so if, at any point, try to stop me. I mean, I don't have to go through the whole thing. Uh, if I want to try to get the idea across, and then I'll, I'll be staying a few more hours after the talk, so we can talk about the details later. Uh, so, why do we study n equal to uh, CFDs again, super conformal field theories, and why they have been at the center of mathematical physics for over two decades? That's a legitimate question to ask. Uh, again, if you are really convinced that this is not an interesting thing, I don't know if I would convince you, but uh, let me try at least. So, the the, the basic point is that. Um, uh, in, in some ways, n equal to SCFTs in four dimensions, and I'm going to be in four dimensions throughout the talk, they're kind of in a sweet spot between being constraints enough that you can do a lot of progress. So I'm telling you that I'm really trying to push for a complete classification of those theories. So there's a, you need a lot of constraints. But then, uh, you know, well, enough not constraints so that there's an interest in physics. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the time to give you how the classification is going for, for highest supersymmetry in four dimensions. But for instance, if you go to n equal four, uh, of course you get more constraint, but the more constraint you get, the less interesting possibilities you obtain. So it kind of gets a little boring. So in some sense, it's the, an, an ideal spot to learn about field theory, and this has been actually happening in the last two decades, and I believe that it will continue to be the, uh, the case. So you know, you, you have a lot of phenomena, of course, that, that you're quite, still quite distant from, from the real world because you have a lot of supersymmetry, but you can learn things about field theories in general. And as I told you, this is kind of really the main, my main motivation to study those theories, to aim for a complete classification of those theories. Um, and you probably, many people are familiar with it, uh, there's a lot of connections between uh, n equal to SCFTs and field theories in different dimensions. One example, this is one example, but there's many more, is the famous class S construction, which it's a construction which is stuck from some six dimensional theory. You do something very canonical by compactifying the six dimensional theory over a Riemann surface, that means a two real dimensional surface, and obtain a four dimensional n equal to SFT. That's what made uh, David de Gaiotto very famous, and there's a huge literature on it. So, again, n equal to SFT allows you to, to 
to study, also to learn about theories in different dimensions. And there is this idea that uh, that you can kind of like study from six dimensional theories, you can obtain all the theories in lower dimension by compactifying, and you can really put uh, uh, this, you know, this idea that Waffa also kind of claims is as almost uh, a given, you can put it at, you can put it a test with studying the four-dimensional theories uh, by, by trying to check whether or not you can obtain all the four-dimensional theories on six-dimensional or not. What's almost a given? Uh, the Vafa so claims that basically it's obvious that you start from six dimensional, the, this famous 6D to common zero theories, which are, which are the, the, yeah. the six dimensional maximal and supersymmetric field theories that have been completely classified, and you obtain everything else by, you know, by compacting and manual. That's a, that's a, not a single counter example has been found so far. Uh, well, but it's hard to find a counter example, right? Because if, let's say you find a, you find a theory that has no, cannot be, I can give you many theories whose, uh, the idea whose uh, direct construction of six dimension is, is not known. Then you can, so when, it, when it's not known, and you mention this to Kumro, does it say that, well, someday somebody will find it? Right, but then, okay, have, exactly. So, so it's very hard to find a counter example because it's very hard to show that, yes, I mean, these theories that I'm giving you cannot be, uh, okay. cannot be obtained in 6th dimension, right? But on the other side, I don't think that it, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not disagreeing with, uh, with the statement at all. I'm just saying, I don't know if there's a whole lot of, uh, of evidence besides kind of the general picture, which is kind of reasonable, but I don't know if there's a whole lot of evidence. Just one follow-up comment. I think to make a proof that his conjecture is not correct, if that's the problem. I'm not trying to make that proof. If you were to I'm aim sorry. at that, then uh, Wafa's models have to have a universal feature that they all took on zero models must have, and if that is lacking, then that's, that's it, right? In what are such features? I mean, I would be very I curious. I would be very curious, because I think, you know, in particular this question of class S, uh, I'm interested in, that is, for instance, I can give you counterexamples of theories in four dimension and rank one, are very, relatively simple, which today, they do not have any realization from, uh, from two comma zero. So, so, so I would be very interested in, uh, if we can, if we're able to identify such universal features. I, I'm, I'm really actually interested in, in that. Though I, my objective is not to prove that conjecture wrong. I'm just saying you can test it uh, more in, 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 in this framework. And then, of course, there's, uh, for instance, uh, Clay Cardo and Thomas Dimitrescu, along uh, as well as others, have started a, real, a kind of study of introducing supersymmetric breaking uh, deformations of these theories and see if you can, you know, if you can say something about it. So you, you got, you, let's say you are able to classify all four dimensions and go to SFTs. Then you can introduce some energy flows that break supersymmetry and supposedly learn also something about uh, non specimenic field theory. So uh, that's, that's a really starting. I mean, there's a very little you can say at the moment about the non specimenic phase of those things. Okay? So uh, hopefully that, that kind of gives you a picture of why do we, we, we need to study these theories. And in particular, I just tell you this, my idea is the, is the notion of trying to develop a, a classification. And the kind of the bottom line idea of the classification would be a, a bottom-up approach as compared, for instance, to from slim view constructions, which I see as a top-down. Meaning, we, instead of like trying to provide all possible uh, constructions for those theories, what we want to study are the, the, the constraints from low energy supersymmetry and superconformal invariance, and try to understand, study those constraints in details, and construct all possible uh, examples that, that can be. In particular, uh, there's the thing that I'm going to introduce more systematically, which is the notion of a modular space of vacuum. It's believed that any n equal to a CFTs in four dimensions will come with this gadget, which is the modular space of vacuum, which is a geometry which gets a lot of mathematical structures if the theory is supersymmetric enough and, and superconformal. And so this, you can ask, can I classify all the modular spaces of vacuum which are compatible as coming from an n equal to a CFT? That's kind of the bottom line of, of, uh, of the goal, of, of, the, of the program. And, it, and, the, and the answer, I believe, is yes. Uh, I mean, again, there's, again he, also here, there's a lot of caveat. And uh, let me make you a, a kind of a clarification. Is that, let's say I found this jump. So uh, let, let's say I found a modular space of vacuum which is compatible as coming, as being associated to an n equal to SCFT. This is not a proof that a theory which has such a geometry exists. It's just a, a necessary condition for that geometry, to, for that theory to exist. So if this is not about actually constructing those theories, but what is useful is that 
you know, through the study of these geometries, I can tell you a lot about the theory that should exist. And, and it would have uh, that, that geometry as a modular space of vacuum. And so you kind of identify targets for, for explicit constructions. But the advantage of this is that you kind of be much more systematic because you're really trying to understand what are all possibilities they can do. And then, yeah, of course, along the way, I'll try to be as clear as possible about the assumptions that I'm going to make. Questions, at least on the bigger goal? I mean, in the long term, you should be able to eventually even say why certain points are missing. I mean, if you just had some some space, and then you say except this one and this one, and maybe no, no, no. yeah, exactly. Uh, then you should even eventually hope to find out why is that. You know, well, well, find the refinement of the space that. It that would, I mean, that's an open question. I mean, that would be ideal. Like you would say, oh, you know, the reasons why I said that this space is compatible is because I didn't realize that there was exact constraints that are not imposed. Had I imposed that constraint, that space would not be allowed allowed, allowed and so forth. And again, the reason why we say, so that, that's possible, that's more of a dream than, than, than a realistic scenario. But the one thing that I can tell you for sure, that once, it, once this, calculation, this calculation has been carried out systematically, surprisingly, basically nearly all modular space of vacuum which are allowed are realized. So, so that's kind of remarkable. And so of course, this is kind of maybe, it's only my perspective, because I've done this and I've realized that we've discovered so many new theories that have been missed by just uh, by just finding this thing systematically, and so now I'm very confident that this actually, the overwhelmingly you get that the, the, the modular space of idea that you find that are consistent actually do correspond to theories. But that's my experience, that, uh, that's the perspective that I come from. So that's why I, don't, I also think that that's very useful. And anyway, this kind of thinking systematically, as I'll tell you also uh, in a minute, has actually taught us a little bit, quite a bit, uh, at the very least in our understanding. Okay, so that's the fun to talk. Uh, I'm going to be a little more systematic. I'll, I'll hopefully uh, clarify, uh, introduce what the modular space of vacuum of these theories are and what are the different branches that I'm going to use. Uh, I'm going to spend some time to review some of the important structures on the Higgs branch. So I told you most of the work I've done so far on the Coulomb branch, but this today I want to review very briefly. And then I'll review for you this very beautiful, I think, connection between n equal to CFTs and non unitary two dimensional conformal field theories that was uh, formalized by Leonardo Nostelli and Beam now six, six, seven years ago. It's been a kind of a very large field in itself. And then I conclude by giving you why I put it all together and show you how you know, putting you know, the Higgs branch, the VOA together can really give you a systematic way of building things. Okay? Okay, so let's set things up. Uh, again, uh, I will just be brief, but hopefully somewhat pedagogical. So I want to introduce here, you have n equal to super conformal invariants. So the, the, the way in which you kind of label the operators of, of these theories are, are in the following way. I'm using a notation of a paper that I should refer to by Thomas Dimitrescu, Clay Carter, and Ken Trinigator, which have done this amazing work uh, of writing a systematic way of labeling multiplets of super conformal field theories in any dimensions with any amount of supersymmetry. The literature was very scattered and they done something very systematic, so I'm trying to honor their, their effort and use their annotations. So they label uh, the multiplets in this way, in which this O here uh, gives you some indication of some sort of shortening conditions that the multiplet satisfies. And then here are the quantum numbers, and in, in the case of n equal to uh, in four dimensions, the quantum numbers that label the operators are j and j bar, which are the, the, the Lorentz uh, Lawrence pen, uh, delta, which is the kind of dilatation uh, eigenvalues, is the scaling dimensions of the operator, and capital R is the spin of the sc 2 r symmetry, and little r is the charge under the UR symmetry. Uh, n equal 2 supersymmetry, uh, hopefully this is familiar for everybody, has a, an r symmetry which is sc 2 r cross 1. We care the reference for this roughly here. Uh, so it's uh, 16, 12, uh, dot, 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 dot. Okay. Uh, and I think it's called, it's, I think it's very, it's very, so it's a uh, Thomas Dimitrescu of Blake Cordova. It's 150 pages more or less, so it's very long. Uh, what they've done is really they've systematized this thing. I find that that was incredibly useful because, uh, and it's called uh, super conformal multiple data dimension, something like that. But it's very, it's very clear that when you, you know, when you hit the right paper, it's very obvious. Uh, great. So, so that's how I label. Obviously, again, just to make it very clear, uh, what those, this, this is, there's supersymmetry, right? So stuff fields are organized themselves in, in super multiplet. 
there's a super conformal multiplet, right? So the, you, you have a lot of fields combined in one object. This label is super conformal multiplet, so these quantum numbers really label the primary, the bottom component of the multiplet. So once it, so this is not doesn't mean that when I I'm not referring to an actual operator, I'm referring to a set of operators. Only one of the many set of operators in the multiplet will have actually those quantum numbers. But the point of superconformal invariance is that in, by knowing the quantum numbers of the bottom component, you can construct the whole multiplet in an algorithm. Well, in a, there's an algorithm to do it, which is explained in the paper. Sometimes it can be complicated because it's, there are the shortening condition. That means there is some nulls and so forth. Okay, good. So that's the general picture. Is that any question? I just remember, uh, is there a generic form of the shortening condition or the, the constraint for, you know? Uh, yeah. So did you, I don't know about generic, but there is, there is a bunch, okay. that, which I'm not going to review okay. because it, it's, a, it's a long term. But they, you know, they call it, in that paper, they call it A1, A2, okay. and B, and then there's a bar things. Okay. And so basically, those mock, instead of O, when you, when you see what you see, you say something A, B bar or something. Which means some specific shortening yeah. condition that, that they satisfy, okay. but it, it's all it's all tabulated, yeah. And the paper is actually very very very, very, very nice to read. It's all in tables, but it's very easy uh, to put. Okay, so that, let's uh, this is to, to, for you to appreciate my uh, skills, my drawing skills. So this is a depiction of the of the generic of uh, the generic modular space of vacuum of these two. I will, I will connect back to the operators. Again, hopefully people are familiar with the notion of a modular space of vacuum. In supersymmetric theories, you have this generic feature in which you have skip operators that acquire bands. It's not in the case like the standard model where the Higgs only acquires specific bands, you know, discrete bands. In, in supersymmetric theories, there is a continuous set of bands. There's flat, so-called flat directions. So this, this, the space of vacuum expectation part of the operator actually can be interpreted as some coordinates of, of a, of a of a modular space. That's that's so you're using the same terminology of for Higgs and Coulomb branches in four as well as six dimension or yeah uh, yeah well the the R symmetry is different but yes I think the yes exactly it's the same it's the same terminology. Um, so but, uh, yeah kind of you kind of across the uh, across dimensions basically in five and six and, and four so it's the, the Higgs branch comes from which multiplet again uh, uh, so here's the hyper multiple. Uh, hyper, the hyper multiple general, and the Coulomb so branch is, is, is the vector multiple. Yeah, I mean, of course, in six dimension you have the tensor multiple. What about the scalars coming from tensor multiple? The tensor multiple does not exist in four dimension. So it's that, that, that they become the, the, the tensor multiple becomes the vector multiple. Oh yes. yes. Well, okay. depends on the amount of symmetry you have. Okay. If you have one common zero, then it becomes. Okay. Vector. Right. So, so the, basically, you, your conformal theory is this dot, yellow dot in the middle, right? Because why would I get that? Because the moment you turn on a bed of an operator, if the operator carries scaling dimension, of course you're breaking conformal invariance spontaneously. So the, the, that's not quite true, but basically you, you, but the, you can flow, you, you start a flow that you might wind up in another conformal field theory, but you're breaking, uh, you're starting the flow, you're, you're moving away from your initial conformal point. So your conformal invariant, your conformal vacuum is this guy, where all the beds are zero. And then there is basically three subspaces that are important. Every conformal, any conformal uh, SCFTs, but not any. But generically, uh, SCFTs will have all three components. And so there's one component which is called the Coulomb branch, another component which is the Higgs branch is green thing. Uh, of course, the depiction is completely random. Those are uh, complex spaces, so with, uh, this is not an accurate depiction, in a, even in a simplest possible case. And a mixed branch, which is this blue thing. So what is the major, um, I will review the, the detailed structure for you for the moment. I want you to get the fact that the Higgs branch and the Coulomb branch only intersect, I hope that's clear from the picture, only intersects at a point, which is the, the conformal point. The mixed branch kind of like, uh, it, it go from one to the other. So the mixed branch has intersection on both with the Higgs branch and the Coulomb branch. Whereas the Coulomb and the Higgs, they don't, you know, aren't intersect. Is there a simple way to see why the intersection point is conformal and nothing else? Uh, uh, why is it conformal? Yeah. Uh, why this point is conformal? Yeah, is there a simple way to see that? Uh, yeah, um, not that I can come up. I mean, this can be out of free in general. But which is a trivial conformal. conformal. Yeah. Is it always free? Uh, no, 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 no. It could be, it's, 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 it's kind of a, a conformal. 
trivial limit. Well, if you just think of canonical normalizations of the operators there, that's, that's where you're setting your, your that's if you're having multiple that's in the bed of, you know, the vector of scalars to zero. Okay. Zero. Well, zero. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's the point. The point is where all the vectors are zero. Yeah. Oh. This, I mean, this is the origin kind of like of the whole model. Oh, I see. Well, that helps. Okay. Because right. yeah. why there were nons if you Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Good. Um, so let me be a little, uh, let me kind of give you some sense of uh, what, so again, I, I try to use the color coding, remember the, the Coulomb branches, right? and I, I don't have, uh, just, but that's going to be helpful, but I try. Uh, show it again, then, if you have to learn the color. So it's uh, red, turn, blue, and, and green. Hopefully, I, I was, I'm now, you put it in, maybe it wasn't as long as that. But at the very least, this slide, you see blue, green, yellow. I think blue and green should be switched. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so what is the Coulomb branch? Uh, let me give you again. I'm not trying to write uh, going down the parallel portion of writing the Schrodinger condition, just because uh, uh, it will take me too much time to to introduce it. Just let me note it on on, on the blackboard that this the, the Coulomb branch is uh, that branch that I draw the red thing, which is parameterized by operators which have this following uh, quantum number. So they have to be scared. That's kind of obvious because otherwise they would break. Uh, Lawrence invariant, and then they have to have be uncharged. Remember, this entry is the SU2 R symmetry. They are uncharged. They carry whatever you want to charge you want. That's actually not true, but in principle, you show that um, Philip and I show that there actually there's a lot, there's a lot of constraint. But in at first uh, at first uh, look, it seems completely arbitrary. But the scalar dimension, which is this label down here, it has to be twice this uh, that you want to charge. Okay. So let me write it here so that Coulomb branch has j equal j bar equal 0, and then has uh, r equal 0 and delta equal 2 equal 1. Okay? This is just kind of operators, right? You do a kind of yeah. All of them are kind of yeah. No, all of them are. Yeah, so that's kind of just from the, the, the algebra. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's just. The, 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 yeah. What, 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 here, the information is that there's a set of color operators. You take the set of color operators, and the Coulomb branch is those ones which have. Or are in charge under the S to R symmetry. Right? So that, that, that's what characterizes it from the kind of point of view. Okay, and, and you know, again, if you in mind uh, Lagrangian field theories, those are a kind of standard, those are basically I can, uh, the, this O, whatever, with these charges, corresponds to a trace of the scalar of the vector multiple. That's, uh, that's the kind of uh, thing. So, what are the features of the Coulomb branch? Generically, there is a NV, where N is the dimension. So the Coulomb branch is some map, is some variety, which has a, a complex dimension in V, and this, this complex dimension tells you the number of free vector multiple. So it, the theory basically on the Coulomb branch is some U1 to NV. So whatever it is in the, in the, in the CFD, it can be as complicated as you like, it can be non Lagrangian, you have no idea what the freak, you know, the fuck is happening here, but then we go on the Coulomb branch, and it's just the U1 gauge theory of put the power in V, so you understand the theory very well, so that's why studying the theories on this modular space of vacuum is useful because you might not know the conformal limit, but you do learn about the conformal limit from, from Brown. Uh, the UNR, obviously, you're giving that to an operator that carries one R charge, so the UNR is continuously broken. Again, let me uh, really quickly give you a, 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 a review of what is known from the Coulomb branch. There's a conjecture slash belief that every interacting SFT in four dimension, n equal two, has a Coulomb branch. Uh, this is a bold statement. Uh, I can tell you some indirect argument. Uh, there are weak arguments. So if someone comes with uh, with an example of an interacting field theory with no Coulomb branch, unless it's in a very specific features, I would be I believe it. But right now, since there is no counterexample, I, I claim this belief. So this would also mean that any theory comes with this gadget. So by studying those gadgets, you should be able to pick up all these. Is this a continuous line of the? This, this, yeah. is, a, this is a complex. It's a it's a complex variety. So it's a it's at the minimum as a one complex dimensional thing. So it's a it's a two real dimensional. So it's a curve, a complex curve, or what? I mean. Well, the, the, so I the, the, I define the dimension of the Coulomb branch as the rank of a theory. Oh. So it's a complex curve for this rank one theories, oh. but it's a complex surface or 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 whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, one of the work that we did with Philip, uh, myself, Philip, and some of the students was a complete classification of the rank one theories, which is 
those ones which have the Coulomb branches that complex curve. So we have a complete list. This is a big table. You probably, there's a lot of information that are hard to parse. But these are the flavor symmetry. Let me tell you that basically all about the, this theory here, the first, uh, so each entry is a theory, is a different theory. Let me tell you that just basically this theory, the first and the second block were known. All of them, all the others were not known. So we were able to find a lot of new theories, even though this is the simplest case. So our systematic analysis is really given now. You built them by going from six to four, or you? No, 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 no. That's important. There's, it's bottom up. So we we are just looking at all possible geometry. I mean, this would, would take one or two talks by its own to describe how to write this stuff, this table. But it's by just looking. So those polar branches are a special scalar variety. If they are super conformal, they are scaling invariant. Mm -hmm. So they're very tightly constrained. And then you do, you do a systematic analysis, and you come up with basically those. This is the all possible. Uh, possibilities of compatible theories, and then we came up. You can compute a lot of stuff by just studying the theory on the Coulomb branch, and then some people have been, was able to were able to find. So we get candidates for new theories, and people were able to find from 60 from other different theories. But we came up with the candidates by just looking at the consistency of the Coulomb branch. So can I ask? I mean, so should I think about these as like one like? The extent that I can think about them from empirical language, this is one vector multiple with any number of hypermultiples. Yeah, but the, the interesting thing is that uh, so you can think about it. No, no, there's, there's only one, two, and three, and the third one is the Shabu question mark, which are the And all the others do not have that picture. Right. Okay. Yeah, so you, you, of course, it's, you know, if you have a Lagrange theory, then uh, yeah, this is one, only one vector multiple, and whatever, however many hyper is such that the theory is conformal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's not right. count multiples without having the Lagrange theory. Huh? You can still count multiples without having the Lagrangian theory. Well, time uh, well no, not really. I mean, in a sense that you know, the, the multiple is the fact that it has a it has a vector is a um, multiples and stuff are defined by the constraints that they satisfy. But this is a no. I think this is this is an interesting. It's a cute way of computing central charges in classes, but I don't think that actually means that there's a Lagrangian. You, you can't really do anything. It's not really that you can write anything down that has one vector multiple. And I can tell you examples where there's no Lagrangian theory, but I know the multiple, right? So why does that? You know the hypermultiple? You know, you know, you know those multiplets, this kind of, uh, but you can't write it, what I'm saying, you, you know, let's say you find a cool branch operator, you can't write it as trace or something else. The only thing you can do, you can tell, oh, there is an operator that can represent the cool branch as this, this quantum sure. But if I have three fields, the vector multiple and the hyper multiple, which you can't. You know, usually that's how you parameterize the, your Coulomb branch, right, with some phi to the end. Okay. So the first part of the table, is that the Jervis Douglas theory? No. The, the, so the first part of the table are the ones that are very familiar to everybody, probably. Or those are the, the F theory. It's a, the, the, a D4 probing a, a, a seven brain singularity. So there's the Minahan and Marshansky theory and the Jiris theory. Yeah. Which is, for some reason people, even very people that know a lot about animal theory, they, they think that those are the only theories that are requirements. And so the singularity you are giving, so this would be also the, the, the Tate, the classification of the singularity? Kodaira, is that the Kodaira? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then there's a refinement of that Kodaira. This is basically a refinement of Kodaira classification. But then you say you get more than they get from F theory? Oh yeah, absolutely more. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's interesting. So, yeah. but, but, but then, I mean, so, so I thought that the Lapa was saying, so all the theories in some sense which you get from six dimensions are constructed from the Z theory classification. That, that, is, that is the part of the things I was saying. It seems to me, so, for instance, Sakura, Shafir uh, 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 so we talked a lot about it because she has been trying to, to construct those things in that theory. I think she has uh, finally found one. But what I'm trying to say is that, you know, there's clear you know, issues that are counterexample, but I don't think Buffer, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm wrong. I, mean, I don't think Buffer is very familiar with the fact that there's many more theories that do not count from it. There was also the fact about those frozen singularities, right? So where you, where you were saying that some of them you, you cannot really get from a geometrical way, but still there is some way around it. So you, you say there are even more and some There are even, even more. You know, and I'm not saying, I'm not claiming at all that this cannot be done. I'm just saying, I'm just saying it's not obvious. The kind of, the, your naive pictures of what are the theories that you can construct from F theory is certainly only getting a subset and probably not. But if you also said that the people really found explicit realizations of these Yeah, theories. in class sets, in class sets, persons. 
process. And actually, I mean, so I have to go ahead because there's a lot of more things, but in the, not yet, yeah, I don't know, I think we're talking about that. But I mean, it's class S, it's not a theory. Okay, Higgs branch. So Higgs branch, let me write it here, it's just the fact that, again, it's another current multiplet from the point of view of current multiplet, is basically kind of the same. Again, it's a scalar, and the difference here is that it has a, an R charge, that's a dual charge, and not a non u one R charge, so R is non-zero, and little r is zero. And delta is two capital R. Uh, this is your Hapa multiple in general, uh, remember in the, the, the standard thing. I'll be quick because I need to uh, speed up a little. Um, and, and so this is very similar now, basically, while the the, hit, the Coulomb branch has this uh, vector multiple as like the basic construct, the basic building block, in Lagrangian theory, the Higgs branch is associated with hyper multiple. And, and again, because the, the hypermultiple structure is different, this is not very similar to, to the higher dimensions of conformal theories. Here, the Higgs branch is not for, doesn't have integer complex dimension, but it has integer quaternionic dimensions because it has a hyperkiller structure. And this is purely connected by, and this is, sounds very complicated, it's not very complicated at all, it's just the question of the fact that it's associated with hypermultiple. It really is not, it's not a big deal, but it's written just the fact that the Higgs branch, the, the Higgs branch has even complex dimension. That's the same thing as saying integer coordinate dimension, very the same thing. So in this case, again, you're giving a vector multiplet which has R symmetry, as you R symmetry, so that's the one that is continuously broken. So I'm not giving you any uh, more details about the Higgs branch, I'll give you in a second. And then the mixed branch is kind of obviously a mixed thing, right, which is in between. So again, it's a scalar, the operator that, I, that I'm parameterizing this thing, but they carry both uh, S2 to R and U1R charge. And this, this corresponds to the fact that you go off on the Coulomb branch and the X branch, and this, the mixed branch is obtained by kind of intersecting the two. So both R and uh, little r and capital R and non zero, and delta satisfy this relationship. Okay? Uh, this, this, uh, I know that probably you haven't, you haven't heard much about base branches, but they'll happen generically in theories, in Lagrangian theories. This is not an exotic thing. N equal four theories, they have mixed branches. SU3 with six flavors, uh, which is at N equal to a superconformal field theory, has mixed branches. So it's, it's, it generically happen in mixed branches. So this is not something uh, at all exotic. This has been known for 20 years. And you can construct it by basically pairing, taking a trace of some hypermultiply combined with, with a, a scalar of the vector multiply if you find a gauge variant guy and, uh, and a parameterized the uh, Okay, good. So, any question about the mixed branch? Sorry? Okay, so let me make you one more statement and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll again ask you for questions. Uh, so I told you about the spaces that I that, that, that basically I described about the depth of this operator, which I've summarized here. And um, but the one thing that I haven't told you is that those spaces are not smooth. Okay, those are singular spaces, uh, and singularities actually are key. They're not something. I mean, you, they, they create complications, but they give you a lot of information about the about the theory. So really, uh, what we study in our approach is mostly understanding the singularity structure rather than the smooth part of the theory. Especially on the Coulomb branch, the good part of the theory is just a bunch of U1 theory, U1 factors. It's completely boring. But the similarity is exactly where stuff becomes more interesting. And this is kind of the main insight of Sauer and Witten, I would say. I mean, I'm not maybe there's many, many insights in those two papers. But like, one of the main insights is the fact that they understood that the similarities, where, where the metric becomes similar, some things, sometimes there is even worse similarities, is where Physically, you have states which at a generic point of the of the modular space of vacuum are massive, and if they become massless at some point, when they become massless, you have singularities. So singularities represent places in your modular space of vacuum when the theory has extra massless states. So there is an enhancement of low energy degrees of freedom which are present in the theory. Is that clear? That's a key point that we need to understand it, that whenever you have a singularity, you have to think that along the singularities on the modular space of vacuum, there's more, uh, more low energy degrees of freedom. By singularity, you mean the metric divergence in the modular space? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, 
uh, there's two deep type of singularities at the very least. Metric and kind of the complex structure become similar. So usually people don't appreciate that there's a difference. And when I say people, I think uh, even experts have uh, in the back of their mind that, and it means that they mean different things. What I, what I, the first approximation, I'm just referring to metric similarity. The complex similarity is a little bit trickier, uh, but the, this, this notion of n, having mass of the frame is really where the metric has some, some delta functions. Okay? And this is true on a mixed branch, on a equal branch, on a hex branch, whatever you are on a model of space. Cool? Okay. So, one thing that I would be here about, I have to be very honest, I don't know if there is a proof that that's the case. That's something I'm missing. I'm, I'm sure that everybody believes that, that, that there is a one to one correspondence between master states and singularities. I've never seen a proof of that. This is irrelevant for the talk I'm going to give you, but just now I'm going to be honest about the results of the Okay? So, questions? So how Great. do you find in general, define in general this, this matrix on the, on the moduli space by the low energy effective series or the, the kinetic curve? Or? Yeah, but this is, this is the, in the case of Lagrangian theory, right? And uh, in the case of non-Lagrangian theory, then you, that's what you want to do. You want to find all possible metrics that are compatible and constructed. Because when you say, for example, it's hypercalar, it, it has to have a metric, right? So I mean, they're... they're, they're, they're no, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Well, all the question is how, 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 and so, so the, the Coulomb branch is Kegel probably, or, or what is this? So, so Coulomb branch is special, it's called special Kegel. Special Kegel. Uh, it's a, it's a, that is a bit scaling here. The, the actual special Kegel is the fact that there is a, an, a low energy SP2RZ, where R is the rank of the theory, electromagnetic duality. So you have this the whole structure of having special coordinates that transform a property. And the vibration of the blah, 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 that's special killer. Um, and each branch is a hyper killer. So this comes from the, the SV2, right? So the SV2R symmetry, because I think. The, yeah, the, 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 the SV2R symmetry. As, as, as quadrium. Precise. The SV2R symmetry gives you the hyper structure on this guy. Mm -hmm. And the mixed branch? The mixed branch is a hyper killer, they have a mixture of both. Right, because, you know, basically, in some limits can be seen both as quantum branches and mixed. The direct part of that space, I suppose. Uh, that's that's no, no unfortunately it's not oh. a direct problem. That's a problem. That's a whole problem. Not not always. No. no. Oh. And uh, did you uh, I, so I don't I don't I. That's somewhat what we're after, right? Trying to really understand how those things come together. Uh, it's not a given that it's only. Right. And you say so. So one can find the metric in, in some sense. I mean, for some example. <coughs> I mean, this is very simple, right? Because like you you know in your right if you have in the back of your mind. If you ever in back of mind, maybe all the Slavonian sort of cases that you've seen, like SU2 with no flavor and so forth, those are non-conformal. So then the modular space of value is crazy. When you enter, when you end, enter its conformal invariance, you have scale, scale invariance on the metric. So that constrains tremendously. So that's why the quadratic classification basically it gives you seven possible metric spaces that are special here, basically. So, so you have some, some, something like isometries, which you... Which oh, strong isometries. Without scale invariance, you go nowhere. Which you can use to contract the metrics, right? Because normally when you do not have isometries, it can be very, very hard. It's impossible. I, mean, I don't know if it's impossible, but yeah. even with the... With the so, rigorously, we are thinking about scale invariance uh, when you actually... Thank you. And just quickly, with, um, in a formal theory, in defining the metric, is this just defined by the two-point option? So I don't think so. That's that's an open question. I mean, this is this is tremendously you know, uh, uh, it's tremendously interesting the fact that there is no real connection. So we, I think first of all, it, the, I mean, this is again this could be a talk on its own. But the question is like, take the operator. Let's say you give me all the information I want on um, of the conformal invariance, all the operating coefficients, all the scale, all the operators. How do I, I reconstruct all this information? I'm going to say on, on the modular space of vacuum. On the Coulomb branch, I don't think there is anything that you add in the chart. I think on the Higgs branch, it's the two functions of a uh, single operator. On the Coulomb branch, there is no, there is no clear connection. We don't know how to reconstruct those things. So that's an interesting question. And another, th another thing that people don't know, there is not even clear that give, giving me some scalar operator, how do I know if, whether or not they get a bad or not? I don't think that's enough. Okay, great. So let me let me go off, go ahead and and um, and describe to you some a uh, theorem. So I want I want to now describe the Higgs branch structure, right? I'll try to be quicker, but uh, but it's good that we go through this thing at least systematically. I'll I'll give you the the main ideas and try to avoid the details, though. Think details are coming. 
Uh, so there's a theorem and there's a branch trusting. So uh, the, the eighth branch, I, I told you there's a hypercular variety. In particular, hypercular are also holomorphic symplectic. This sounds very complicated in words, but really it's not very complicated. Hypercular is a symplectic structure that are holomorphic and blah, blah. So basically, uh, because, because I told you that it's a holomorphic symplectic and there are similarities, then the general definition of what a uh, H branch is, is a symplectic variety. That's what it, it, it is. And there are interesting, very interesting te uh, theorems. Uh, this is an open, I think, an open uh, field of research in symplectic geometry, understanding the similarity structure of these varieties. But there's one theorem that's very, that's very clear, and is the fact that the, the, the symplectic variety, in general, the way in which uh, uh, singularities come together, form this ca canonical stratification. So what, are, what does that mean? It means that the, the singular structure of these things is very is, is fairly constrained. I wouldn't say very constrained. What in what sense? So uh, right now, let me make sure that I follow my good my convention. Okay. So Wn, let's say that Wn is your your Higgs branch. Well, switch notation unfortunately in a second. Then this Wn, I told you that is, is is some variety which has a singular locus. I told you that there's some some variety that is similar. Now you can ask, what can I constrain the property by just general results? Of what the so I call Wn minus one. This is the singular locus of the Wn. So that theorem tells you that Wi, all the Wi are symplectic variety. So Wn i. So if this is symplectic variety, variety, this also symplectic variety with all the all the constraints that comes across. Right now, the point that can happen is that Wn minus one, which is the singular locus of this guy. That itself might have singularities. So there's a Wn minus 1, minus 2, which is also a symplectic variety, and so forth, until we get to the origin. So there's kind of a, a nesting of singularities, and of course, you know, the singular locus of this guy with respect to the Higgs branch is some more singular uh, sub variety. W0 is smooth. W0 is the origin. Is the origin. Always. The, you, you always go down to the origin. But because, I mean, remember, one, one simple thing is that symplectic varieties have to be uh, integer one and nine. They have to be even complex dimension. So one thing that immediately comes across is that if you have an X branch which is, I don't know, 10 complex dimension, its singularities have to be also even dimension. You cannot have a three-dimensional singularity or four, uh, five complex dimension. So you have to go down by two, 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 until you get to Okay? So this is what I call the Matryoshka, just because it's like, it's those things kind of like the structure is replicated going down, and I already kind of draw. Uh, I've drawn how to uh, identify these things. This is since basically the stratification gives you a partial order on this, on this, on this. So, look, so these W's, each one of those W's, which are represented as kind of the singular loci of going down in these six branches, are called the symplectic leads. This is standard terminology in symplectic geometry. I don't think I'm. But if you're familiar with, you don't need complex stuff, you don't need anything complicated to be, to understand the gist of this result. Well. Okay, so in, you, you can, you know, you can uh, identify the structure by just giving what is called a Hasse diagram. So putting up on top the, the, the complete space, which I also call, in terms of this annotation, MH on my theory T, where T is a four dimensional theory. And then you go down and you identify this, the more and more singularity of the theory. Uh, let me just make one point so that I can be scripting uh, some of the details. One point is that uh, how do I identify what is the physics of having singular loci? The physics of singular loci means that there has to be some extra massless states in the theory. Okay? That's what I told you that that's, uh, that's how similarities are identified. And so the, the, the fact that there is a similarity below the bigger Higgs branch, it tells you that there has to be on this similarity some theory, which I call it uh, TI. Sorry. So this is T1. It's the theory that, that, that it's the low energy effective theory on the, on the first singular locus, and then a T2. Is associated with a second singular locus and so forth and so on. So every time you have a singularity, you have to have extra massless states that come in there. Questions? 
Okay. So let me let me sh skip some of these details. This is just going through what are the possibilities of the of the structure of the T's. The things that I want to do to get to get from from this from this summary is that the, the Higgs branch has this stratified structure, and at every level that there is a low energy effective theory which is associated to each one of these leads. Is there some gauge group that's growing? Perfect. So the, the intuition, there is no gauge group because like here, uh, the reason why I'm introducing this is because there is no Lagrangian. But in case you have a, let's say you have an S2N theory, right? You, the, the idea is that you have an S2N theory on the, at the origin, right? So the first leaf, like, you know, W1, it's some, you know, when you, when you start turning on vectors, you can break S2N to S2N minus 1, S2N minus 2, S2N minus 3, and so forth and so on. So the generic point Wn is the, is the, the spot, the, the low the low side on the Higgs branch where there is where there is everything is broken, right? But there is a sub low side where there is an unbroken S U M minus one, right? So in this case, the, the theory associated with this guy will be some theory with an S U M minus one gauge group, and then you break the the, the, the gauge group more and more. Does that make sense? Does that clarify? Okay, great. So let me give you now a review, quickly, quick review, just an idea of how VOA tied into this discussion. Okay. Do you know, how do you know, okay, so we said that's the end, but suppose it's just G, right? Some rank, you know, whatever group. How do you know when you start what G you're going to end up with? No, no, you don't have a G in fact. So it's always an SU. No, you don't have you don't have a group. This is a oh, this, no, this is uh, so that's what I'm saying. So the point is that the, that's why I'm using this abstract language of T's. Yeah. It's the idea is that you don't have that there is some series, there is some constraints that you can build off of your of your Lagrangian intuition. But really, it's not Lagrangian theories. You don't have like a great group at all. So so understanding this pattern of Higgs, that's one that's one of the results that we have identified. It's un, highly non trivial but I'm saying the same intuition you have with Lagrangian, you have it with other theory. But there, the rules of what you can, you don't have a gauge group that is decreasing. You have this sets of non-Lagrangian theories whose rank is decreasing. And there are some of them that you can patch together, like if you're going down from S1 and S1 and so forth, and some of them that you cannot patch together. But I'm saying this intuition of, of, of partial hitting translates incredibly well also for non-Lagrangian theory. But you need, Things like VOAs to understand that because you can't turn on fields of it. Okay. I think uh, in, if you're uh, concerned about time, I think I'm still uh, I'm still going to be able to give you the, the gist of it. Uh, I, I will skip the details, but I, I'll give you the, 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 the main idea. Okay, good. So this I can I can quickly you know I have to do a little bit of advertising with this is an amazing results map even if you're not familiar with it. That there is a map that is called Chi. Forget about the cohomological reduction of the OPE algebra, just, but the bottom line is the fact that there's a map from any, here I need to write SCFT. So any n equal to four dimensional SCFT, there's a map that takes that theory to a vertex operator algebra, which stays for basically the, a 2D CFT. It's not quite that, but that's fine. Uh, this is a paper, it you know, has over 200 citations, it's a big, it's a big, it's a big deal. Um, and, and so, let me let me give you a little bit of the details. How do how do how do we get that, right? Uh, so what do you do? Again, this is a schematic picture. So if you want, after that, I can give you the cosmological fancy thing. But I'm going to give you the, at least the idea of what to do. So the first thing you should do, you start from your four-dimensional theory. It's a CFT, so it has a bunch of operators and a bunch of OPs and a bunch of things. Now the point is that you first of all take the operators that you put on a plane just to have some hope that some two-dimensional structure can arise. But of course, if that was the case, then people would have found that a million years ago, or maybe at least 20 years ago. And um, so that's not enough, right? So the other thing you need to do is the fact that you have to basically literally project to a subsector of the set of operators. So you put these operators on a plane, and you just project to a subsector called the sugar operators. I'll tell you in a second what sugar operators are. You throw away all the others. And then you start taking OPE of these operators, right? You take the operators of two sure operators. When you take the operator, the, 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 the OPEs of two sure operators, then some extra non-sure operators appear. 
thermic circuit. So in order to get the 2D CFT structure, you have to continuously throw away uh, the extra crap. So you take two RPs of shoot operators, they don't close the shoot operators, they close on something else. But that's why the cohomology, you take the cohomology that really gets rid of all non shoot operators. If you do that, then you find some, some structure that basically has the same uh, income structure of the two dimensional. Of course, with the, uh, there's some extra stuff that I'm not telling you, but basically those are the two steps you need to do to really get to really get the VR. So how do you know where the shoot operators are? They, they satisfy two. Uh, I change notation. Uh, you know, J1 and J2 are are basically what I call J and J bar. Okay, that's how the mapping goes. And then E is what I call delta. Right? So. Really, shoot operators is just a bunch of shooting conditions. So any any operators whose scaling dimension satisfy these two equations uh, is a shoot operator. Okay. Now you can go through the sets of stuff. You see that you know that's why I wrote the, the quantum numbers here. You see that the quant the quantum branch operators don't satisfy that. That's obvious, right? Because you know in order to so if you put j1, j2, and r equal to zero, then the only these operators do not to be sure it has to have delta equal to zero. So clearly this is not the case. You find that instead this is clearly the H branch operator are clearly sure, and these are clearly not sure. And then there is other. Uh, but that was noticed from the get-go, so that is why the VLA is tightly connected to the Higgs branch. From the get-go, it was very clear that the Higgs branch are the prototype of the shooter operator. There are many more than not shooter operators, for instance, that they're not Higgs branch. So the stress tensor is a shoot operator, which is not a, a, a Higgs branch operator, and there's many more. But the Higgs branch operator are the main kind of objects that survive into this projection. Okay? <coughs> so there's a lot of properties of this of this VLA. Um, for instance, one is non-unitary. That's something that was shown from the first paper. Uh, you, you have some C and K. So okay, I have to say that let's say you have a flavor symmetry in four dimension. Okay, your, your theory has a flavor signature, then your VOA, your VOA that you get in, in two dimension also has an affine flavor signature. So an affine current. So your 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 flavor symmetry, your flavor algebra translate to a flavor algebra with a whole one. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Precisely. So there is an infinite enhancement of I think it's a conjecture of, but it's kind of believed to be true. Right. Mm -hmm. This is this is the answer. So there is a the, the central charge of the two-dimensional theories is minus 12, the, the central charge of the four-dimensional. And the, the, the level of whatever factor, flavor factor, is equal to minus one-half of the 4D factor. So that you get from the anomaly from the anomaly? That, that, that you get, I mean, remember that, if you, I told you that you can compute the OPEs of, of, of the operators oh, in 2D so by just, just projecting. You just yeah. match it. Yeah, you might just match it. You just pick, yeah. So when you say non-unitary, is there an easier way to see? Because you start in a 4D theory where the OPs are. Yeah, I think there's a very, very easy way to see. It's a fact that those things, you know, these guys are positive. You put a minus sign from, you get negative. I don't, no, I, there's no way I'm stopping you now because I don't want to let you. Uh, but I don't think there is any. So this would be. Uh, there's no real intuition of why, besides this thing. This would be amazing. You know, this would be really unveiling. A deeper understanding of why, uh, of the physical reasons why you might have a non-unitary thing sitting in the four-dimensional thing. At the moment, it's just this obvious fact. You probably wouldn't have enough uh, primaries if you were to do it. You kind of want to have very, very many things. Hey, no, 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 it's not. I, I, it's because you're saying because it comes from trying to. Keep no, 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 no. <laughs> you, you know, for instance, you got minimal models also in this case. So, but not unitary minimal models. So. So I, I, I really, I really don't think uh, there's a deep understanding. Um, so anyway, so th there is a bunch of properties, right? So there's a big, a big effort. Chris Beam is really leading it, but there's a bunch of other people. I guess also I am, uh, but I'm not. And I, I wouldn't claim that I'm as uh, as involved as Chris. But you know, by by now I'm actually. Uh, it's very fun to study those theories and try to understand general properties of these two D CFDs. Because again, if you were able to understand that, then you can, you know, 2D CFTs are very constrained, so again, you sh if, you, if you're able to classify all possible 2D CFT that satisfy X, is, X number of, of relations, that would give you an indirect classification of 4D, because, you know, the 4D mapping to those set, this set. But anyway, 
And there's this paper by Chris, but throughout there's a bunch of papers in which in which they constrain these levels much more than, than what I just said. Using, you know, you can still use a unitarity in 4D. So the violation of unitarity in 2D, it's still obviously somewhat controlled by the fact that there is a there is a positive definite uh, inner product in 4D and so forth. So it's not that everything goes off the window. But something goes off the window, you know, in some controls. Quasi this uh, is some fancy way to say, uh, let, let me tell you in a second. Uh, this. So this is a table, I'll, uh, I'll hold it here for like two minutes and two seconds because I have to go. Uh, <laughs> but this is a set of example. For instance, you know, this, um, these are, are geostatus theories. Uh, some of them have the Virazor minimum, uh, minimum models show up. So a fine Gizmoody algorithm. If you're from, if you're if you're really into to these CFDs, the interesting thing is that you have a fav your favorite, your simplest example seem to to have uh, an appearance here. There's W algebra uh, and so and so forth and so. On. Of course, of course, as you uh, consider more and more crazy four-dimensional deep, how they, all, all of these theories here are particularly simple from one way or another. For you. Okay, so the cool thing is that this is one of the major achievements, I would say, that has that, that been done by Chris and Leonardo uh, a couple of years ago. There was, a, there is a, an object that mathematicians had already identified, uh, don't ask me why, uh, but uh, it's called the associated variety, that is a map that takes a VOA, to mark these versions of very relative in two dimensions, and associates to this VOA, canonically, a, a holomorphic symplectic variety. Just some crazy, some map that does it. So you have this very complicated set of OP coefficients and so forth, and you spit out a, a co the coordinate ring of an you know, holomorphic uh, symplectic variety. You remember that holomorphic symplectic variety are, Higgs branches of four-dimensional theories are holomorphic symplectic variety. And so basically, the each branch of your four-dimensional theory, which is this MH, WN, what I call WN, it's canonically identified as this associated variety. Remember, chi of t, it's a, the, the VOA associated with your four-dimensional theory. So you give me your, your VOA of the four-dimensional theory, and then spit out the Higgs branch of the four-dimensional theory. So, by this map. Quasi-Lister means that uh, this associated variety is usually has an infinite number of symplectic leads. And quasi is it's basically is a finite number. And again, because you know that, from what I said before, the Higgs branch of four-dimensional theories has a finite number of symplectic leads, then that's the characteristic of quasi -lisa. But again, this is kind of the steps that you're trying to do to really categorize in mathematicians' languages what these things are. Okay? Okay, so can I, how do I, now I want to try to reconstruct the, the very operator algebra from 4D data. The Higgs branch is, is key, but it's not enough. There's many examples with theories with same Higgs branches and different, and different theories. And so there is a procedure that connects with what I said before, which, so basically, and, and let, me, let me tell you this, and then basically I'll, I'll skip in, in, to the conclusions, and in, in, you know, really, I think I, I need three more minutes. So basically, your, say you have a four-dimensional theory, Okay? You have a four-dimensional theory which has this six branch. Right? There's a bunch of symplectic leaves. That means that each symplectic leaves there is some low energy effective theories, some extra massless states that appear from the bottom. The idea is that there is, you can reconstruct your and, and let's say that, you know, let's say you don't have any no idea about the, the, the theory that you're studying, the the, form, the final theory, but you do know the relative operator algebra associated with one of the theories that appear on the Higgs branch. There is basically a prescription, I mean, uh, with a lot of quotation. It's an algorithm that works in some cases, and we hope that it works in many cases. That, tell, that gives you a, a way of constructing the VOA of the total theory from the VOA of some of the theories that appears on the Higgs branch, then to some extra crap that basically somewhat uh, uh, takes into account of the geometry of the various implied. There's more details about that, but there's a prescription to basically reconstruct the VOA of the total theory from the information of the Higgs branch. Which is somehow what I was saying, that's what you need to try to arrange, uh, to try to build things together. Okay? Let me tell you just one thing that you can take, there's a lot of tests that you can do on this, uh, on this prescription. It's not that you, you have to match central charges, you can match a lot of stuff. Uh, okay, so what is the idea? So this is a systematic analysis which I won't be able to, 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 to get into details. Uh, basically, 
is the idea, let me, okay, let me just uh, conclude with these three slides. So we were able to, for instance, there's a set of rules, okay? There's a set of rules that tells you that in, in, uh, in rank one, in rank one theories, we know all the theories because we classified it from the column branch, and you can show that the, the, the Higgs branch has a very, is very simple, this very simple structure. So, can you see? Yeah. There's a very simple structure, so there's one supply that leaks in between, and then the total Higgs branch. And then we can, we can figure out, we can constrain very much the space, and we can constrain very much what is the theory living on this space, which we call it T1 IR. Right? And basically, by doing, it, by doing some bottom-up constraint, we are able to analyze the possible direct survey algebra that we can construct by putting this, up, this information together. And what we obtain is that all the non rank one theories basically should come up as the only, only consistent way of putting together some low energy, so, so some low energy data. So there is, a, there is some low-edge data, which is the geometry of this infected leaf and a possible theory that I put on it. If you randomly could count all the combinations, you have basically an infinite number of combinations because the, the geometry of this infected leaf is actually infinite and can be any number. And by requiring that the, the resulting VRA is consistent, you eliminate all of them but the, the known red one. Uh, this is the clear? So what is the idea? Well, the dream is that you can basically build all the, the VOAs in the four the n equal two theories by assembling these fundamental bricks, the fundamental low energy effective theory, and try to go and build it from the Higgs branch perspective what is consistent. And what is consistent is decided by this very tight structure that comes from assuming that the, the resulting theory has a consistent VOA. So that gives us a way to construct all the rank one theories from the Higgs branch perspective, and we've done quite a bit of uh, work on rank two and rank three. Thank you.